to see uh, Rhonda. Oh my goodness, the name slip. I thought Laura's home with me. Rhonda and Nancy here, they've been sick and out of it. Still not feeling well, but they're here, aren't they? So glad to see them here. Glad to see you all here. Um, Want to give a reminder to all you women that this uh, Saturday at 9 o'clock is our women's <coughs> annual monthly or monthly prayer meeting. We begin at 9, we will have breakfast, and Bethany Witt will be our speaker for in the morning. So I hope you all come out to that. We had about 25 last time. I'm expecting uh, more than that this time. Several is wanting to come. Um, continue to remember one another in prayer. Uh, hold on a second. I've got notes everywhere. Okay. Um, our heart this week has been on you all, all your burdens and stuff that you're going through, your trials, and my heart has also been on the lost. Um, I couldn't get out of my head this week the hands that's being raised in our church and the empty altars that's been on my heart. And uh, got a lesson here that uh, we're continuing in our series. We're talking about prayer and fasting. And I really felt God's thumb on my back when we studied this this week. And I hope it helps you as much as it helps me. And there's some other lessons we're also going to get into as we get in here. So I hope that God just lets us to get through this till the end. Because I told Roger, I said, there's nothing I feel like we should take out. Everything's so good. I just don't want to take nothing out. So we need the time to get through. So with that said, I'll stop rambling, okay? So we're continuing on our study. We are studying on prayer and fasting. Uh, in the Old Testament, I'll just refresh our minds real quick here, get us on the same page. The Old and New Testament both define fasting as to abstain from food. That's the biblical definition of fasting. Uh, this is in desperate humility. Uh, we deny our bodies both the pleasure and the necessity of food, exclaiming our urgent need to God's merciful and gracious hand to intervene. Coming to him in prayer and fasting. So why are we presenting our hearts to God in such a desperate humility? Because situation calls for it. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. Um, think of this as an urgency. We go through trials and God hears our prayers. But there's times that he wants us to come before him in prayer and fasting. Um, we looked at this scripture of Matthew 7, 7, 8. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and you shall find. Some reasons, and we'll get into some of those reasons today. Um, but we are asking humbly. We're seeking fervently, passionately, and we're knocking loudly. So the word tells us to fervently seek him. So prayer and fasting done appropriately done acceptably before God expresses a heart that is dependent on him alone, alone, humbly, not, it's not a show and tell response. Now they, um, see, yeah, we'll just use this scripture. Matthew 6, 16 reminds us, uh, Christ saying this, moreover, him teaching on prayer and fasting, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. So they dis disfigure their faces, and they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So in their time, there are some, and even some today, that pray and fast, and they want to be seen as, look how righteous I am. Fasting and prayer does not make us righteous because we are righteous, we pray, and we fast. So it's an intimate relationship with God. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. In other words, look refreshed. Don't look all mournful and sorrowful. Oh, woe is me. Look how I'm humbling myself before God. That thou may not appear to men to fast, but unto the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So he's saying, don't, you know, don't be an attention seeker. Don't be... Seeking the attention of men that seek my attention. Focus on me, he's saying. So prayer and fasting expresses a disciplined heart. It disciplines us in our spiritual walk. It helps us to grow, which is exercise and a persistent seeking. We talked about that last week. 
God's will um, as a persistent widow that went before an unjust God and how that unjust, or unjust judge, not God, unjust judge answered her prayer or answered her request because she was so persistent. How much more will God answer our prayers when we're persistent before him? Prayer and fasting is a persistence, a fervent way to approach God. We're seeking his will. We're seeking his direction. Seeking his care, his protection. So let's look at a couple examples. I thought it'd be great to throw in a couple examples of, of, of how they fasted in the Bible to get us to understand maybe why they're fasting and praying, when God, God called for it in the Old Testament, and we'll get to the New Testament um, more next week, Lord willing, so just bear with me. But Psalm 69 is a Psalm of David. And it says, save me, O God, for the waters are come and up into my soul. I seek in the deep mire where there is no standing. Mire is a deep, deep mud. Think of quicksand or mud. There's no standing in it. In fact, the scripture says that there is no standing. You can't stand on mud. And David is so overwhelmed in his life at this point. That he's like, I have nothing to stand on. I come into a deep waters where the floods overflow me. So we see here that David has an urgency, a need before him. So he comes to God in prayer and fasting. He said, save me, O God. You hear the urgency. And there's several types of uh, kinds of deep mire that a believer that we sink ourselves into or we get sunk into. Maybe the, the deep mire of unbelief. Maybe the deep mire of trial and difficulty. The deep mire of sin that's on board and we're not dealing with it. We're not allowing God to deal with it. The deep mire of temptation or oppression. So he goes on to say, David... I am weary of crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail me while I wait for my God. Here you can feel his exhaustion. He has prayed. He's cried. He's fasted so much. He has nothing left in him. Don't know where he's going other than turning to God. So here David is overwhelmed by his suffering. His enemies persecute him. He had some personal sin on board that he repented for. He is hated without a cause in this scripture. And his friends have deserted him. His family's deserted him. But he focuses his attention towards God. And how does he do this? Through prayer and fasting. And we see that in the scripture as we go on in the same scripture. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, he says, an alien unto my mother's children. For zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And the reproaches, the shame, the disgrace of them that have reproached thee, talking about God, are fallen upon me. In other words, David, is, he has such a love for God, a passion for God. And he stands up for God. And those mock God also mock him because he is a child of God. And so he's got all this hate. He's got enemies that have inflicted harm on him. He's not doing what he's suffering. He's overwhelmed. When I wept and I chastened my soul with fasting. So here we see that he is disciplining. That's what that chastening means. He's disciplining his soul with prayer and fasting. That was to my reproach. In other words, he says, I made sackcloth, and they when they wore sackcloth back then, it was a sign of humility, a sign of submission, a sign of grief. So I made sackcloth also my garment. In other words, he didn't want to be comfortable in his own skin, so he made himself uncomfortable, and he focused on God. Now, we don't have to do that today. I'm reading the Old Testament, okay? And I became a proverb to them, a puzzle to them. They that sit at the gate speak against me. These were the officials that sat at the gate, and they mocked him. And I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee. In other words, his eye is not on the mockers. It's 
It's not on his enemies. It's not on his suffering. It's not on his pain or those who mock him, but it's on God. He says, but as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O God, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Acceptable time. You know what an acceptable time is? It's when God is near. And he is near to us today. He's near today. There's going to be a time that he's not near. And that would be after he comes and gets the church. But he's near. Today is the day of salvation, right? So seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Uh, Isaiah 55 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. James 4, 8 reminds us to draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to, God. Draw nigh to, draw nigh to you. God comes near to us when we call upon him. When we embrace his word. When we study his word. When we apply his word to our <coughs> life. Our situation. Um, to draw closer. To seek him earnestly. And we can experience when we draw nigh to God his forgiveness, his salvation, not just saving of the soul, but salvation, a rescuer in all kinds of forms. Whatever you need him to be, experience his healing, his deliverance, his provision, his protection. His grace, his love, his mercy, his strength, his peace, his rest, and on and on. His goodness. Did I mention grace and mercy? If we expect a spiritual breakthrough, we're going to need to approach God with a broken heart. As we see David has. David had a heart, a passion, a zeal for God that it made him the object of scorn. And the end of many jokes, and even his friends and family members, but it did not stop him from submitting his entire heart, his soul, to the will of God. This is surrendering his will to God. I'm sure he had lots to say about his enemies. But God, not my will, your will be done. He says, I wept. I chastened my soul with fasting. Wept. And he came to God with a sincere and broken heart. You're going to hear me repeat this through the entire lesson. And we'll draw on this point towards the end. He chastened his soul. He disciplined. Put it into subjection to God's will. Now when we pray, we do the same thing. But there's those times in our life as many here in this church are facing right now. And I believe that we're facing this um, trial because we are a fueling state. <coughs> Not those mess about in the church, so don't get me wrong there. But we are a fueling station to many people. I believe that you are the best prayer warriors on this earth. Enemy doesn't like that. There's attack on just about every family you turn around. Yet, yeah, look where you're at right here. You're here. You're here serving, putting your best foot forward for God. So in those times when we are overwhelmed, and I have heard that word a lot in person and come in text, overwhelmed, overwhelmed by several here in the church, myself being one. So when we're like this, when we feel this overwhelmed and we feel like our prayers are not getting anywhere, prayer and fasting is something that we don't hear about. We don't get taught enough about this. We don't utilize. It's not popular in today's society. We are a lazy generation. We're fast food. We're microwave. We're insta, insta whatever. Why not right now, 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 now? There's no discipline in this generation. Not much. Far and few in between. So prayer and fasting together is an effort. It's a discipline. It's an exercise of the heart. He says, my soul, wept and chastened, 
my soul with fasting. The soul is the appetite of our life. The soul is the seat of our appetites, the seat of our emotions and our passions. That would be our fears, our worries, our concerns, our, con our whatever, the activity of the mind, the lies that the enemy tells us, the negativity that goes in our, our mind by the enemy or by hearsay. The activity of the will is the seat of our appetites. There's times where we're like, what's the use? I'm praying, God, you're not answering. You don't know that. He works behind the scenes every day. Just because he doesn't answer right now doesn't mean that he's not answering. We need to learn a few things. Overwhelmed. We can be overwhelmed. But that overwhelmed could go to overflowing with joy. I can speak for myself knowing that all of the sickness that I have been through these past few years and getting worse, that I can say that I have joy. I just told Roger today, I said, and I told Kathy, we had, she came over, girl, that's her heart, brought me food and flowers. My husband hasn't done that for a while, by the way. I food. food, not flowers. <laughs> Waiting on the flowers. <laughs> Where was I going with that? Where was I going? What was I saying? I lost my, I see, distracted me with flowers. Joy, that's where I was going, joy. Overflowing with joy. I was just telling Roger on the way here, and I told Kathy the other day, I always fear that y'all don't believe how sick I am because here I don't appear to be sick. But this morning, last night, the last couple days, I've been about ready to go into a severe, I can always know when that vertigo is coming on. It's, I was bouncing off my walls, literally running into walls yesterday. And this morning I was very sick, and I just kept saying, Lord, I need your strength. you got to heal this right now so that we can do what you want us to do. Got into the lesson and was trying to refresh my soul, and I felt his strength. I felt his strength. Now, I, I don't feel great, but I feel great. I feel joy. That's joy. That's joy. That can push you forward. And that's through him. From overwhelmed to overflowing. So maybe prayer and fasting, if we're not getting anywhere, maybe that's what we need to do. First Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. We're always supposed to be constant in prayer. In everything, give thanks, even for the bad days. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He wants us to be thankful. With him. Do, am I happy I'm going through this? No. But am I thankful? Yes. Why am I thankful? I'm thankful because I recognize that God is in control. I'm thankful because I know that he's leading me, that he's teaching me faith, that he's showing me his power through uh, peace or strength or whatever he wants to give me. That's why I'm thankful. He's growing me. So back to David, despite the criticism, David submitted the sea of his appetites to God through the discipline of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting before God is an act of worship. <coughs> worship is an expression and an act of reverence that's shown before God. When we submit ourselves entirely to God's will rather than our own, we acknowledge that God is Lord, that he is master over our lives. In true worship, we find ourselves in God's favor and under his blessings. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, living sacrifice yeah. holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and others is expected of us. Now, this scripture here is talking about ministries, but it also applies to prayer and fasting. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I tell you, prayer and fasting are one of the great ways to live out this scripture right here. One of my favorite scriptures in God's word. One of them. How many of it? That's one of them. So fasting in the Old Testament was specifically commanded. We see this in Leviticus and in Numbers uh, particularly. And they are the only ones specifically commanding fasting in the Old Testament for a specific purpose. 
Now this pertained to the Day of Atonement. It was given to the Israelites uh, by God under the law of Moses. It was for the Day of Atonement. The Atonement be defined as to make amends for sins. Remember, this is Old Testament where God was still establishing his children as a nation, setting up rules for living. Day of Atonement took place before the time of Christ. And it says, uh, Leviticus 16, 29, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. Do no work at all, whether it be done in your own country, stranger, that's Jordan from Monday. So even those who visited had to pray and fast. That's what afflict your soul is. So the ritual was held once, uh, uh, the ceremony was held once a year. They uh, repented, gave their sins to the priest. The high priest went into the holies of holies and uh, uh, made sacrifice and pleaded to God for their sins. Thanks to God, we don't have to do that today. We don't come to him with prayer and fasting for our repentance. But I'm using this as an illustration of one of the reasons why they prayed and fast. This is one of them. We've seen first David's situation where he was in urgent need of being overwhelmed with all the things around him. Here, another reason, it was commanded by God in the Day of Atonement of what they did. So, um, the term fasting is not explicitly is not explicitly stated in Leviticus, but we see the word afflict your souls. So, fasting here is understood. It means to humble. That's what that means. Um, in fact, when they fasted and prayed during this time, they even, they didn't have just food or drink, but they also went without marital relations for a 24-hour period. They didn't wear leather shoes for the purpose, we don't have to do that today, I'm giving you Old Testament right now, because uh, it eased the foot. If you wear shoes, you're a lot more comfortable than walking barefooted on that hot sand that they have, right, in the rocks. They didn't use cosmetics or lotion to ease any dryness or abrasions that the sand would do. So all of this was to make them uncomfortable before God. They were trying to humble themselves on the outside before God. So one fasted from the pleasures that made one content or comfortable in their daily lives. This is what they did. And the problem with today's church is that we are too content too content and comfortable in our relationship with God. What do I mean by that? In other words, we appear content with what discontents God. Examples of budgets. Are we content and is God pleased in our lack of growth and faith? In our lack of faithfulness, whether it be to the study of his word and applying it to your life, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in prayer and fasting, whether it be to what he called us to, whether it be in to regular service of worship. Fill in the blank. Faithfulness. Do we have that lack of faithfulness? How about our lack of obedience? God, I know that you're asking me to do this, but it's just so much easier if someone else does it. Lack of worship. Lack of forgiveness towards others. Lack of compassion towards others. Have we found ourselves falling short in any of these areas? It's quiet. It was quiet when I studied this. I had to search my own heart. If so, we become comfortable with that. And we must learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm not always comfortable being obedient to whatever God asks me to do. I'm not always comfortable with that. I'm not always comfortable forgiving someone who wants to continue to hurt me right back. To be forgiving. I'm not always comfortable with being compassionate to those who don't show compassion to others. Do we understand what we're saying here? So we got to ask ourselves, have we become too content and comfortable in our current position and not totally trusting in God? So again, what is the purpose of prayer and fasting? We find a great example of this on the Day of Atonement. As we said, prayer and fasting, it was to humble oneself. They did this from sundown to sunup. It was a 24-hour period. They did this to receive forgiveness, to show the remorse of sins. It was a tool to teach dependence on God. 
God is a great teacher. It often uses hands-on teaching aids to teach his people something. For example, in the Old Testament, he would, before, uh, when he would talk, God would talk to Moses, he would call upon him, he would call the people and sanctify them holy before they come to me in my presence. And the steps that they had to do was outward activities that symbolized cleanliness, as in um, this involved activities of washing their garments, shaving their heads, refraining from sexual activity. And they did this to have cleanliness, a spiritual cleanliness. What they showed on the outside was to hopefully work on the inside. That's, that was the purpose of this. He was trying to teach them to have preparation and dedication before they went before God Almighty. These acts were meant to teach and to guide the heart to be aligned with God's desires if they chose to follow him. That's what this was. Outward obedience proved the heart to be in sync with God's will. It proved dependence, dedication, holiness. Those who are set apart for service. So, back to the purpose of prayer and fasting. Humbling oneself through prayer and fasting. Represented a truly remorseful, a broken heart before God, and in need of his restoration. They did this for the Day of Atonement. That also, we need to restore today. We are his children. Maybe those times are so overwhelming, we need him to restore us in so many ways. Prayer and fasting is a way to get to that. Um, in the Old Testament scripture, God often called on his rebellious children to repent. And he encouraged them to turn and to render their hearts towards him. And if we look at the story of Esther, they wore sackcloth. And, and had ashes that they put on their head. And this was a sign of mourning, of distress. It was also an act, they did an act of where they would tear their clothes. This was to show uh, that they were humbling themselves before God. It was an outward expression of how they felt on the inside. And that they were tearing their hearts unto God. That's what they did in the Old Testament. Some more uh, examples of Old Testament scripture of prayer and fasting we find in Joel 2, 12 and 13. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your <coughs> heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rent your heart, and not your garments. And turn to the Lord your God. He is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and great in kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So God is saying, so God is saying, it does no good to tear your garments, to waller in ashes, and to wear sackcloth if your heart is not in the same condition when you're presenting it to me. That's what he's saying. You can do all you want on the outside. We can pray and we can fast. Hey, I'm fasting. Look how righteous I am. That does nothing. For our heart. That does not present to God a humble heart. So let's not miss the point. If we, um, yeah. if we continue to repeatedly sin uh, without a remorseful heart, it does no good either. That's what uh, uh, in the Day of Atonement when they sinned, they had to have a remorseful heart. Um, and it does no good to come in prayer and fasting if the heart is not in the same condition. We have to be remorseful. We have to have a broken heart. So, in today's lesson, we've noticed a common thread required in prayer and fasting, and that is a broken heart. It's an earnest heart. It says, afflict your souls. Humble yourselves before God. It's sincerity. It's an open and honest heart before God. So God desires a heart that is torn for him. God desires our hearts to cry out to him in earnest appeal. It's interesting when we're talking about repentance. If God found the hearts of his children without remorse, he was under no obligation to forgive them. Not that he wasn't willing was under no obligation to do so. Why, why was that? Because there would be no point because sin would continue to flourish where 
true repentance was lacking. There wasn't a broken heart. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And saveth such as to be of a contrite spirit. So prayer and fasting teach and discipline the heart to focus on God. Prayer and fasting humble the heart before a mighty God. David also wrote in Psalms 35, 13, I humbled my soul with fasting. Trying to compare here how we've seen in the Day of Atonement when they sought repentance, how they had to have that broken heart. We have to come to him in the same manner as we've seen with the example of David with the same type of attitude in whatever our need is. So we don't have to fast today to be forgiven. God's word tells us that we need to only ask, believe, confess that our sins before him, but still the heart has to be in it, even today. That's New Testament. Second Corinthians, New Testament, 7.10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, in other words, no regrets, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow is when the heart is Grievous of the sins committed. We recognize that our sin has offended God. On this walk, if we're not stirred in our heart when we commit a sin, we're not very grievous. If we do some sort of act that is offensive to, towards God, that should make us grievous in our hearts and we should drop to our knees and ask for repentance. If we do not feel grievous in our heart when we to sin is to offend God. He sent his only son to die on the cross for us. His blood was shed, poured out for our sins. I'll never forget, I heard a story. I want to say it was Doug probably teaching, and I can't get all the facts, but uh, there was a young man who got ran over, crossing the street, and he got ran over, and his blood was on the highway. And they cleaned up the scene. He died. They cleaned up the scene. And life continued. Those cars were trampling through his blood, his son's blood. And the father out there crying. The crossing, the trampling of my son's blood. Is that not what we do when we sin against God? We trample on the blood of God's only son. So we have to recognize our sin offends God. Worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow, uh, it says, world, uh, the sorrow of the world worketh death. Worldly sorrow is having a moral conscience or awareness of sin, but the heart is unaffected. It's empty. The heart's not involved. Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of, O oh God, thou will not despise. The Hebrew definition of broken is, this means to be broken into pieces. The Hebrew definition for contrite means to crush. So when we present ourselves to God in prayer, in prayer and fasting, it should always be of a broken heart, a heart that is surrendered to his will. God is saying, if you sacrifice anything, let it be your heart given to me in pieces and crushed that I may make you whole again. That's what he wants. He just wants sincerity. That's what he's after is our heart. Our willingness to be submissive to his will. So we intertwined here um, prayer and fasting, and we used the Day of Atonement to understand how the heart was involved when they came to God. It is the same way when we pray or pray and fast, that God wants that same heart. That's what, I don't know if I made that clear. That's what I was trying to do. I kept bouncing back and forth. But that's where God was lead, leading us. I told you before we started this lesson, my heart has been stirred for those who are unsafe. We have many here that has been raising their hands over the last few services. I think Caleb, when he was preaching last week, I, well, I was, had my head bowed but I was counting the hands as he was saying, and that, and that. There's at least five. At least five. 
and those same ones are coming over and over again, and they're not affected. We need to pray that God gets a hold of some hearts. Oh, yeah. And that doesn't exempt us either. If we have something troubling us, we need to use the altar. And if you don't use it here, use it at home. If we are so overwhelmed, prayer and fasting is a good way to get through to God. God, I don't understand the situation I'm in. I'm at a loss of what direction to go. Prayer and fasting is the way to go. Seek Him. He may not give you the answer right now, but I promise. And we'll talk more about how to pray and fast, what's the proper way of doing it. We'll get more into the details of actually doing that. But something to be prayerful about and, and to apply in our, our lives, it, it helps us to grow. And once again, it doesn't make us righteous, but because we're righteous, we do it. I hope this hit home for us because I see, I see a church as Tom preached a month or so ago, worn to one. I see us weary. We don't need to be weary. We need to keep fighting and keep pressing on because there are souls that need us to pray for their soul to make it to the kingdom of heaven. It's all the Lord has for us. I hope you're being it today. I'm still scared for me today. You know, Tanya, God can able to humble. Yes. I mean, yes. every one of us have had that experience. He'll humble, he'll humble you yes. where that's only him. But he wants us to willingly humble ourselves. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's, that's every day yeah. when we wake up from this day. We've got to realize who we're praying to. That's God it. Almighty. That's, that's it. That, that humbles you right there. And Rick, you said it. Yeah. And, and through prayer and fasting, that's a willingness. We're nothing that's right. That's exactly it. And sometimes God puts it on us to pray and fast. And other times, it's a desire that comes from in our own heart, which is also in God's will, right? A willingness. Thank you for that point, Pastor. And if God has to come to us, it's a whole lot harder on him. Yes. A lot longer road, road, harder road to travel, isn't it? Love you all. Hope you enjoyed this. Good job. Sure.